It was the 25th anniversary of Kospas Sarsat that provided the inspiration for the substance of the Sarsine 2007 plenary. We begin this year's conference with first-hand accounts from our special guests who were saved during search and rescue incident incidents. I'm pleased to welcome our first guest, Mr. Jonathan Ziegelheim, first alerted air rescue through Kospas Sarsat, currently a resident of Florida, Mr. Ziegelheim came to our attention on a cool November day in 1982 as he was piloting a small plane which was assisting in a search and rescue operation in the Rockies. Suddenly, he ran into difficulty. Well, please welcome Mr. Ziegelheim and listen to his story. Well, ladies and gentlemen, my name is uh, Jonathan Ziegelheim, and I'm a pilot for United Airlines, currently a Boeing 777 captain. 25 years ago, I had the opportunity to participate in the first rescue of the SARSAT COPUS satellite rescue system. I was a flight instructor at the Brampton Flight School near Toronto, Ontario. One afternoon in, in, uh, in mid-August, I had a discussion with another pilot musing on how I would like to fly across Canada in a light aircraft. About a week later, the pilot, Gary, called me at home and asked me if I was serious. I said, yes, I was. Why? Well, as it turns out, a father had lost his son in an aircraft accident near Dawson Creek in northern British Columbia. He and a nurse were headed out on a medevac and were never seen again. An extensive search by the Canadian forces turned up no trace of the aircraft. The pilot's father was interested in seeing for himself the area in which his son had gone missing. Gary had an aircraft available, and if I was interested in flying him out there. A week later, we were airborne in our way, on our way from Toronto to Dawson Creek in a Cessna 172. We arrived three days later, picked up the survival gear that's required that far north, and headed out. For a week, we flew between Dawson Creek and Deese Lake. The pilot's father was able to understand why the aircraft was never spotted, and I believe he found some peace in why his son loved flying in the majestic mountains of northern British Columbia. We commenced to fly from Dawson Creek to Watson Lake in the Yukon, to Juneau, Alaska, and to Deese Lake. On September 8th, it was time to return to Toronto. The weather in Deese Lake was clear and sunny. A flight plan was filed to Dawson Creek, and off we went. Soon we were over the mountains, enjoying a pleasant flight, when suddenly the weather deteriorated. A quick consultation with the chart provide an alternate route following a river through a valley. The visibility was good, but the ride was extremely turbulent, and the clouds were below the tops of the mountains. We were looking for a branch of the river that we were following. Obviously, we chose the wrong one. As we followed the new branch through the valley, we came around the corner to face a dead end. We had no choice but to try to climb over the hill at the end of the valley, but were unable to clear the terrain. We contacted the trees in a perfect stall condition, meaning the aircraft was at its lowest flying speed. The trees grabbed the landing gear and twisted the aircraft around, and then we pitched over and hit the ground almost vertically at 40 miles per hour. It was incredibly quiet. Just the hissing of the engine was all I heard. I shut down the engine and released my seatbelt. The father was already opening the door from the seat behind me. I looked over to see Gary, I saw him moaning and dazed. His upper body had broken off the control column and his face was covered in blood. I remember pulling him out of the aircraft while he was coming around. All of us moved away from the plane just in case there was fuel leaking. I remember we sat down and looked at each other and then looked at the airplane again. We were stunned for a while. We looked at each other to see if we were okay. Gary looked the worse. Once we cleaned his face, we realized it wasn't as bad as it seemed. Gary had a split lip, a broken nose, and broken ribs. I told him to look at the controls on his side of the airplane, and he noticed the control wheel was missing. The father complained of a painful wrist, but otherwise was feeling okay. I noticed that my, light, my right leg was sore, but didn't really investigate further. We were intent of getting out of this situation, and we're starting to form a plan. We knew from the chart that down the valley, at the bottom of the river, was a lake with a community there. We could hike there in several days if we had to. Our position at the bottom of the trees in the dead end of the valley was not a good place to be if there was any chance of being spotted by anyone. 
So we came up with a plan to hike up the side of the mountain to where we could see a clearing and set up camp there. We pulled out the survival gear from the aircraft and we had enough to be fairly comfortable for a week. We then looked for the ELT, the emergency locator transmitter. We were, unable to, we were able to remove the transmitter itself, but the antenna was fastened to the fuselage. There were no tools to remove it from the airframe. I thought maybe I could cut around the base of the antenna and remove it. So I grabbed an ax, climbed up on top of the aircraft. I took one swing at the fuselage and made a small dent. Then I took a harder swing, and as I hit the fuselage, the antenna popped off and th flew through the air. There were three of us, the three of us watched it go with very wide eyes. <laughs> we picked it up and put it with the transmitter. We hoped it would still work, but we had no way of knowing. As I jumped down from the airplane, my leg became very painful. So I pulled up my pant leg, and that's when I discovered that I was bleeding and that it was probably broken. So Gary helped me bandage it, and we set off down the hill. We made it about half a kilometer before neither Gary nor I could go on. We looked up the side of the mountain and noticed a clearing. We crawled up to the clearing to get as high and in the open as we could. By now it was late afternoon. We set about readying a campfire and cutting green boughs from the pine trees to use for a signal. We set up the tent and put the sleeping bags and other things inside. We made dinner, put the ELT outside, and stuck the antenna into the socket and turned it on. We then settled into the tent for the night. During the night, we heard a jet go by, but could not see anything because of the overcast and rain. None of us slept very well because of our injuries. Every 15 minutes, we took turns releasing the tourniquet, tourniquet that Gary had applied to my leg, and Gary had difficulties breathing. The next day, September 9th, dawned bright with a clear blue sky. It was obvious all of us, all of, we were all thinking, why couldn't it have been like this yesterday? It wasn't long before we heard an aircraft flying close to our position. Thinking it may be looking for us, the other two, who were outside the tent, lit the signal fire and readied the signal mirror. This seemed to bring the aircraft closer, and they soon spotted us. It was an incredible feeling to see the Canadian Forces Buffalo fly overhead. As I was confined to the tent, the other two told me that they had dropped something. It turned out to be a small package with a note asking if we had a radio, and if not, to unroll a long banner, which they did. We could hear the aircraft approach again. I heard Gary say, look, they're dropping a box. And then I heard him scream, look out, run. <laughs> I heard this cra terrible crashing sound through the trees and a big thump quite close to the tent. <laughs> Gary came back and said, wow, John, that almost hit you. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. <laughs> The plane came back and two paramedics parachuted in. They checked our, our injuries and reported back to the plane by radio. They told us the plane would go back to Dease Lake and we would wait for a helicopter to arrive. They didn't have to go far to retrieve their equipment as it was right there. <laughs> <laughs> we were amazed that they had found us so soon. That's when they told us the satellite had rescued us. And we said, what satellite? They told us that a joint program between the Canadians and the Soviets had devised an SAR satellite for just this occasion. However, it was only in the test stage and had just been turned on. This is the first time they had used it. <laughs> Fortunately for us, it worked. That's when he told me it was a good thing it did because I would have bled to death within the next day. You know, I, I was going to end my story here, but I thought, what have you really accomplished by saving someone's life? Well, many, many significant things have happened in the last 25 years to myself and my family. Of course, I met my wife 25 years ago. She asked me to, to autograph her copy of Reader's Digest. <laughs> we now have four children. We've been in, involved in Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts for the last 15 years as uh, Scoutmasters. Because of uh, Lorraine, we've sponsored several children in extremely poor countries to receive a good education and nutrition. We've helped an elderly couple that came to the United States winning the lottery to get a green card. We've helped them with housing to find employment and to buy a home. We took in a family of five, provided financial support for food, housing, and education. Their three boys went on to earn a full scholarship. 
We took in a young couple with two small children for a year till they were employed and could find, rent an apartment and put their kids in school. Now we currently have an 18-year-old living with us, with our 18-year-old, and we're helping her to attend college. There's more I could say about that, but just so you can see, it isn't that by your actions that you've saved one life, but that you've given many people a new life. So it's with immense gratitude that I thank the people behind this great pro program for saving our lives and countless lives since. Thank you very much.